Welcome to episode 51 of the Liz McMullen Show. I am welcoming back guest Carson Tate. It is December. Um, <laughs> when you're listening to this, but it's been, it's been pre-recorded. So Carson, thank you for returning to the show. I am so excited to be here. Sweet. And it's awfully hot outside for December. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this cartoon, and it was um, with God, and I, I guess, you know, whomever is at the pearly gates, and he's like, what are you cooking, <laughs> Texas? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. Ah, you know. I don't care if it's a dry heat that's too hot. <laughs> exactly. So we have three books that I am reviewing this evening, and I thought I'd start with the, the heartwarming story, Beyond Innocence. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could ever so kindly give my listeners uh, the, the lowdown on this particular novel. How about I do, I'm going to read the back blur. Sweet. So weak. After a devastating professional embarrassment, Corey Lance has been banished from the courtroom. As part of her penance, she volunteers with an organization that works to free the wrongly convicted. And soon she's saddled with a case certain to set her up for another big defeat. To top it off, she's battling a strong attraction to her client's sister, a woman with unreasonable expectations. Serena Washington has learned to compartmentalize the negative pieces of her past, except for one, her brother Eric, who is on death row for a murder he insists he did not commit. Loyalty drives her to insist, enlist help from an organization with a reputation for unparalleled success, but Serena's optimism is shaken when she learns the attorney assigned to the case has a reputation for cutting corners. Her whole world is shaken when she begins to fall in love with her. Ta-da. I know. <laughs> this is like a real heavy, I mean, not, not exactly, it's not a read that's like a downer in a heavy way, but because the stakes are so high, and you'd think that the brother who's on death row would pretty much be on the razor's edge, but the stakes are very high for Serena um, and Corey. And, you know, they both have different things going on. It's ironic because Corey is, used to be a prosecutor, um, but is on indefinite leave until she can straighten things out. And, and she, part of her penance, as you said, is working for getting the wrongly convicted out of there, out of jail. And she's on the hot seat because, allegedly, uh, she cut the corner and because she kept... Um, she kept information away from the defense, you know, that should have been given up in discovery. It led to uh, what happens in the first scene in the book where the guy gets off scot-free. Yeah, and, um, and that's, a, that's a huge issue right now um, in Texas and has been for a while. And in fact, um, the legislature was just in session and adopted a whole bunch of new laws um, requiring or enumerating what the prosecution has to give to the defense. Mm -hmm. Although defense, we defense lawyers thought it was pretty clear before. <laughs> Apparently it wasn't so much. <laughs> um, and there's been some very high profile cases in Texas where people have sat on death row um, and even been executed um, for crimes they probably did not commit. Um, and so, it, you know, it's just really, it's, it's a timely issue and it's real. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's very real. When Corey was uh, working for the prosecutor's office for, you know, survival reasons and also just so she wouldn't go batting, she had created a very black and white way of viewing the world that she was um, not necessarily the white knight, but she was on the side of justice and she was going to make that happen and, you know, put people in jail. The one issue with the, well, there are plenty of issues with the death uh, penalty, but the biggest issue is it's very final. Absolutely. And if mistakes have been made and, you know, in some cases there turns out to be DNA ex evidence that proves that the person was not the perpetrator, um, it's a very complex issue. And for 
for Corey, whose entire life, you know, from the time that she was interning, um, you know, and starting her career, it's always been on the side of the prosecution. And she enlisted the help of a friend to try and, you know, do, do whatever she needed to do without having to go to trial. She just didn't want to be a part of that. And she ends up uh, showing up in a place where their entire gig is, you know, trying to do what, you know, undo the faulty work or whatever of the prosecution. And I, it must have made her blood boil. I can't imagine how foreign <laughs> it must have felt for her to walk in that door. And her friend very rightly did not tell her <laughs> what the deal was. <laughs> She's like, well, you didn't want to, you know, take this, you know, take this all the way. So this is what you're going to have to do. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I really stuck her in it because I felt like that was really the only way for some, the only way for someone to see the other side is to be on the other side. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you could try as much as you want and you know, I, I practiced for a a long time and I've run across both, both sides, um, the, that are uh, being overzealous. Um, the prosecutors who believe that any defendant that comes before him is guilty and seeking justice means putting that person away, not finding out what really happened. And then I've come across defense attorneys who believe that all prosecutors are evil and all defendants are innocent, and, and neither side is right. I mean, so I, 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 what I tried to do with this book, whether I accomplished it or not, you can tell me, is to, to show both sides, because even though Corey is kind of the focus, um, I do think Serena, as the sister of, of Eric, who's on death row, gets to see a little bit about Corey's side as well, and that it's not always so easy to make these decisions. I I felt one of the interesting central tenets of the book uh, was that truth and justice sometimes are relative, you know, and and that is not an easy pill for either one, to, uh, Serena or Corey, to, to swallow. Um, Corey was pretty, you know, certain of herself, you know, not necessarily cocksure, but she just was very black and white about things. And for Serena, she needs the person that's representing her brother to be very clear and supportive of her brother rather than, you know, be with somebody who's ambivalent or would not provide the level of support that's necessary to give her brother another chance. Absolutely. So, and and the complicated thing also for Serena is she and her brother had grown up um, with a junkie mother and, you know, had flounced around in different houses uh, once they were discovered. Um, But before they were discovered, her older brother was taking care of her, trying to figure out how to feed her. And as a young person, she didn't know how that got done. But part of that got done was like him um, pilfering, you know, grabbing things for her and for her she doesn't want to ever be like her mother and she doesn't want to be a fuck up like her brother who is constantly in and out of jail and always you know getting into some kind of trouble but in all of her efforts to not um go astray to not walk down that line to not drink alcohol etc she ended up you know sealing herself out almost hermetically from feeling anything or being at risk in any way so she had, I think the three players have a lot, a, ho- a lot on the line. Absolutely. Um, and, and thanks for, for seeing that. Um, I, I just, I think she, she ostensibly, she had the better life. Um, she and Eric, um, he aged out of, of foster care, CPS care. And, and the, the hard fact is that, Kids, kids who are troubled don't don't get adopted, <laughs> um, especially when they're 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 too old um, for someone to want them, you know. And he he it, it appears that he had the harder life, but she wound up having all the trappings of a of a you know she wasn't rich or anything. She had a family who loved her and and things and opportunities, but 
in her quest to not be like her brother and her mother, she, she really didn't have much. I mean, in terms of feeling and emotion and relationships and she She hadn't experienced life. Yeah. She, she she wanted stability, something that she did not have growing up. And what I thought was interesting was that she worked for the same, was it a credit union or a bank? A bank. Uh, Yeah. So she was, she you know, she had opportunities to rise up in the ranks to management and she chose to stay where she was and she liked the, I I guess it's the safety and the predictability of her job and, you know, iron control on her part. And what I think is interesting is seeing her come to life and Corey come to life as well. Because Corey has some tenderness going on in there. She has a lot of kindness and a good heart. And uh, she was selling herself short in so many different ways uh, with Julie Dalmar. The evil girlfriend. (laughs) 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 You know, know, and I I noticed this also in, um, in the other series that we're going to be talking about with uh, the bounty hunter and Luca Bennett basically was going, you you know, she had an ongoing fuck buddy. (laughs) There's no (laughs) really nice way of putting it. And they both mutually agreed that they weren't, uh, that they didn't wish for more. And when they needed to burn off uh, stress, anger, disappointment, they would do so with like fiery passion. Um, but at the same time, there was no true connection, and the same the same is true for Corey. And she doesn't uh, she doesn't see it as starkly until she sees how she feels and what she wants from Serena, and then she sees how how cheap and empty and one dimensional her relationship was with Julie. And it turns out Julie is a colossal user. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and I, I mean, I try not to make her a caricature, but I mean, there are people like that. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to draw a sharp line between, you know, what seems easy and what's, what's messy and how messy can be really good. Mm -hmm. You just let yourself get in it. Yeah. Julie isn't, you know, she isn't the wicked witch of the West. She's just a little myopic and she's very focused on her career and it worked out well because Corey was also very ambitious and they kind of gelled in what they, you know, their perspective on life. And I think in some ways, um, Corey getting in trouble and taking the fall, um, was a, a saving grace for her and in a, in a way you know evil Julie and her promises <laughs> um you know she finally got towards something that was real and I I think it's difficult to write a story you know with the death penalty you know hanging over in the balance but at the same time um there's a lot of passion involved with literally a life and death circumstance and um, Corey is not easily sold on her role there or, you know, whether or not it's valuable work or what she wants to be doing with her time. And one of the things that led her ambivalence was her interest in Serena. And it was because she was more interested in their connection than, you know, at least initially with the work that she was doing volunteer wise, but her passion for Serena keyed into a passion, uh, to help her brother. Yeah. And, it's um, if you if you ask people how they feel about the death penalty, they generally have very defined reactions. And it's, I mean, that's just kind of the larger theme is you know whatever you're whatever you think you feel you you seeing the other side of it, you know, it just kind of messes you all up, <laughs> and it makes you see things from both sides um, if you're if you're in the middle of it. Um, And I guess that's kind of the larger theme of opening yourself up and being able to to take in the other viewpoint and how that can be a a gateway to a bigger life for you. What I thought um, was 
powerful and when we're initially getting introduced to Serena is you know she's so used to she had you know what they say if, if you know there are certain people in your life after a certain point you just have to draw the line and say this is it I'm done I'm done with you I'm done caring I'm done dealing with this and but and still she had gotten a letter from her brother um, with you know one of the simplest pleas you know even if you don't believe in me or whatnot I still want to see you and um, what I, the, the one phrase that came up several times was blood runs strong. And no matter what level of ambivalence she had or frustration, stress, um, also this is her only blood tie. And so she keeps on going. She's not naive. She's not um, um, hanging on to Corey's coattails, trying, you know, to get her, her brother off. But she... You know, she's got integrity and she wants him to get a fair shake and she knows that he didn't. And for all the crimes that he committed, uh, murder and rape were never in the mix. Yeah, and, and I think Serena also believes that if her brother did what he did, then he deserved to be punished. Um, but he But he didn't get like you said, a fair shake at, at trial. So no one really knows if he did what he did. Um, there's doubt and death robs you of the ability to, to, to find out, you know, find the truth. I mean, once you're dead, it doesn't matter anymore. And, and, you know, one of the things I think spurns Serena and the irony of course is the, the rap sheet for her brother was fairly extensive and they didn't really look very closely to see the details and, and, and maybe some corners had been cut. Um, but she had also given up on her brother and she didn't even know what was going on with him until, you know, it's not the final hour, but it's cutting it close to the wire. And so, so it must have, you, you got to think what it must feel like to see people behave in a way that, you know, was unfair to her brother, but she wasn't exactly um, unsympathetic, even though she didn't say that directly. Exactly. I mean, you know, we all, we all have, we all know someone probably who's tested our boundaries <laughs> to, or, you know, just behaved in a way that you just don't want them in your life anymore. But but then that doesn't mean that they, that doesn't mean they're evil or they're bad or, you know, it just means that you just can't take it anymore. And she drawn that line with her brother um, before he was ever accused of this crime. And, and he, he took her at her word at the time and didn't contact her again and went through a trial um, with attorneys that were appointed to represent him. And there's nothing where I've been appointed to represent people. I did you know, I would give as hard a, a defense to and work as as hard for those people as I would for any paying client. But but it was just they saw, you know, they judged him before he they, you know, they saw his rap sheet. They assumed things. They cut corners. The prosecution cut corners. Um, and and he no matter what, no matter what boundaries, what lines you've drawn you don't want that to happen to someone. And if they're your, your brother, your only blood tie, it's, it's huge. It really affects you. When she ended up, um, going, going along with Corey to the courtroom, she also saw how much racism came into play. Yeah. And, you know, it was a stark reality, uh, which was brought home by her being mistaken for, uh, somebody who, you know, a criminal because of the color of her skin. Um, so that, that was a factor in people writing uh, her brother off as well. Uh, one of the other things before I close out the discussion on this book, um, one of the things that I think Corey and Serena had in common in terms of their vocation, they were very focused, you know, very you know, forward looking, almost like a horse with blinders on. Mm -hmm. And then when their life goes, I guess, sideways for, uh, you know, a lack of a better analogy, 
And it's then when they realize that there is more and that they possibly want more from their life and on so many different levels. And that's why I think this is, you know, a, a very unique uh, romance um, where they both kind of could, let's say, you know, the, the issue never came up and Corey was never taking the fall for this particular, um, you know, not showing the, the defense things that should have been shown. And for Serena, if she didn't get this letter from her brother, she'd still be, you know, with blinders on doing her job. And, you know, she'd see women, maybe kiss them and have some relations with them. But anytime emotions came involved, it was, you know, she just didn't want to deal with that kind of risk. And, and I like that they took these risks and, found each other even though it was a bumpy ride and um there are several opportunities for things to just stop cold in its tracks it was destiny it was destiny Destiny. (laughs) (laughs) that just makes me think of once again white horses and 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 knights and or or actually maybe think of back to the future where he's like you're my density (laughs) <laughs> exactly. Because, <laughs> like, you know, little did he know that it's his son who's giving him, like, advice on to how to chat up his, um, his, his soon-to-be wife. And so he's, he's got notes in front of him, and he's reading them, and he totally flubs the line. And she's like, what? <laughs> You're my density. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I, I, um, the idea for the book came... Um, I mean, you know, it should come, should have come from me because, you know, I practice law, (laughs) but, and I've actually worked on a death penalty appeal and been to death row before and it's creepy, but, um, D Jackson Lee is a good friend and fellow author and she, um, is a newspaper editor and she suggested it. She said, you know, you should write a romance about a death penalty case. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) <laughs> Why did I think of that? That's brilliant. But the more I thought about it, um, the more I realized what a timely and, and cool, complex backdrop that would be. Mm-hmm. And um, it was hard. It was it was definitely hard to navigate, but uh, I had a lot of fun writing it. I, I'm happy with how it turned out. Yeah, one of the challenges... Um that many writers experience, especially when there's an element of mystery, is how you do the journey where little bits and pieces drop here and there, you know, like breadcrumbs, and eventually you get uh, to see the whole picture. And it's got to be difficult to decide, you know, how much is going to be held close to the vest because Corey is not telling anybody you know, why she's decided, you know, or if she was intentionally uh, falling on her sword in the first place, she just won't talk about it. Right. So, and, you know, Serena, for some reason, you know, started opening up to Corey, but even still, you know, you have these little twists and turns and we don't really know what's going on with Julie other than she likes to get in Corey's pants and seems to be a little bit dense when it comes to emotions because, yeah, she's the evil girlfriend, but I think she just doesn't... My feeling is is that she just doesn't see who she is and what she's doing as, as wrong. She's just... No, that's she's, just her way. I mean, she's working her way up the ladder, and she likes to have sex. I mean, yeah. And she accomplishes both those goals. And She's like, why? This, you know, this works. We're compatible. And, you know, and then when Corey's not returning her calls, like, she gets a little more involved and so it's not that she doesn't have interest it's just if you if you're used to keep on keeping on you know that's just the way that you can continue forward and she's very career oriented and that's not a curse to you folks out there you know (laughs) you can be career oriented it shouldn't be like the moral to every story kind of like the Christmas story where you know you got to be less focused on that but that's just that's why she is has less dimension because she's so focused on one thing. Um, and it also shows Corey that she was also in a certain way, very similar to her, but that's not what she wants anymore. Exactly. 
<clears throat> so we're going to turn to a different part of the law. Well, you know, lots of rule breaking, but you also did something unique. Why did you decide to do first person for uh, slingshot and battle axe? Oh, you know, a lot of my heroes write in first person. Um, and I, I really enjoy the, um, the first person detective stories. Um, I enjoy, um, Gene Redmond's Mickey Knight series. <clears throat> I enjoy, um, Sue Grafton's books, um, Kenzie Milhon, the PI, and those are all written in first person. Um, there's an element that you get, there's an element of closeness, um, that you get to the character, um, by writing in first person that makes those books as much about the, the, the main character as it is about the, the story. And, um, and I, you know, I just wanted to see if I could do that. Um, well, Gene you know, Redmond, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, but I think what is also interesting is to have a murder mystery, uh, type of book, uh, where you are seeing it from the first person rather than omniscient. And so you're finding it out like what an, that individual, that investigative individual is and what their point of view is. So it's a little easier to kind of keep a uh, little secrets tucked in here and there, uh, for the plot. Definitely. Now you, I, I think you're assuming I do something about plotting that I don't. Um, are you a panster? Oh, hell. <laughs> like, I don't have a clue till I write the last words. Um, I sometimes see the last scene, you know, the day before I write it. But yeah, I, I, I kind of plot as I go. Um, I don't figure out the plot and then sprinkle in all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But do you think because you're a lawyer and you have such an analytic mind that um, <laughs> somehow organically there's some kind of organization process going on in, in that noggin of yours um, that makes you a little less pantry uh, than other folks, which is there's there's no good there's no perfect way to panster. It's very individualized. You know, one of my more shocking discoveries of pansters was Lynn Ames. Really? I was shocked. I was like, <laughs> you know, it was a terrible interview I felt because I was like, I have like pages and pages of notes and think, you know, plot points and whatnot that I'm curious about, like how did she craft it? <laughs> <laughs> and then she sprung it on me. I was like, oh no, whatever <laughs> are we going to talk about? <laughs> no, I think I'm just a masochist actually. Interesting. I I think I enjoy the pain of stressing about what's going to happen next right there with my characters. Um, I'm not kidding. I just really, I, I'm, um, I'm writing the third Luca Bennett book right now, mm -hmm. Switchblade. Um, I'll be turning it in in two weeks. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to end. I, I think I might know. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I do have one question before we get into this, to talking about Slingshot. Normally I can find out why an author has titled uh, the book as they have, and <laughs> usually it pops up in a sentence or whatever and, and whatnot, and I have no idea why you called it Slingshot. Well, you know, that, that's an interesting question. Um, I, the first Luca Bennett story is in Women of the Mean Streets, um, an anthology. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a prequel to the series. Although I, I just wrote it to see if I could write about this character. Mm -hmm. um, and it's called Boomerang. And in that story, um, I, the, there's some, I mean, it's, there's, there's some elements of the story that come back, like, you think they're one thing, but they come back as something else. So, okay, so that's for boomerang. That's boomerang, um, slingshot. Um, David and Goliath, was, maybe? Or? Yeah, kind of a, a little bit. I mean, it's it's a very subtle. There's no, there's nothing really overt about that. Mm -hmm. um, Battleaxe is. Um, <laughs> 
just, you know, the, the, the old, she's well, a battle axe. Well, I'll just let you. <laughs> well, you know, when battle axe, it just makes me think of Vikings. So. Oh, okay. Well, see, see, you know, I was thinking of the old, you know, the woman who. <laughs> curmudgeon you know. And then um, Switchblade is the, the next book, and, and it's because some things switch up for her. So. Aha. And they're all weapons. They're all weapons. And I just thought that would be fun. <laughs> we have <laughs> and some. And they're all weapons that aren't automated. So. You know what I, I found interesting about Luca was, she, you know, you get introduced to her as this badass bounty hunter who's really a pamster at life. <laughs> she's just like she's I just, long to be her <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I thought was interesting was that when she was her job she, she has, she's very well armed and, but when she was a rookie she was so a novice in that category and I, in my head of course you know what, what's off scene I was like how did she go from not having a clue to being um, this badass bounty hunter. Yeah, someday I'm going to write that. But I, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't talk about it because you haven't written it yet. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't expect me to tell you if I don't have it written it down yet because it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Mais existe pas. It does not exist. My existentialist writing. <laughs> It's not on paper. Oh, my it, God. It's not existent. Oh, um, yeah. You know. I want to write, I plan to maybe write a short story about that someday. Yeah. Of and, course, um, I'm thinking my, about The Stranger. I'm like, oh, you know. Uh, can, <laughs> exactly. I'm Albert <laughs> Camus. <laughs> yeah, it's, you're profound. <laughs> she says, like, an ass sarcasm. <laughs> um. You know, if you have it handy, could you... And I, already, I know what I'm going to name that story. What will it be? It'll be Colt 45. <laughs> that just makes me think of beer. <laughs> well, is that a bad thing? <laughs> no! There's lots of beer in this book. Lots and lots of beer. And then I think, of course, <laughs> I can't think of his name, uh, but he, so, he was the guy for Colt 45, and I think he was in the Star Wars movies. I can't think of what his name is, and I'm just going to be, oh, it's been too long. Um, and I was like, okay, I have too many synodic connections. So why don't you give us the back blurb for Slingshot, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. All righty. Luca Bennett makes her living looking for people, but her sights aren't set on lost children separated from their parents at a busy mall or elderly Alzheimer patients who wandered from the nursing home. She's a bounty hunter paid to apprehend fugitives on the land. Luca caught her latest job from new in town criminal defense attorney Veronica Ronnie Moreno. Ronnie's client, a seedy local businessman, Jed Quitman, failed to show up for court, and Ronnie wants him found right away. With Jed's mug smiling from dozens of billboards and low-budget late-night television commercials, Luca figures finding him will be a breeze. It doesn't take long for Luca to realize there's nothing simple about this job, from a stranger threatening her to stay away to the fiery hat woman who has Luca looking for more than a one-night stand. The hunt for Jed quickly turns complicated and the pursuit is fraught with danger, as is her attraction to the elusive Ronnie Moreno. In a case loaded with twists and turns, can Luca find everything she's looking for? <laughs> Sorry. You know, you know, this, 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 uh, Ronica Moreno, Ronnie, is quite the hotsy totsy woman. <laughs> yes, she's very stylish, very intelligent, um, and once, it, you know, I feel like Luca gets snookered by sexy women all the time. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Hard knock life, you know. She, <laughs> she like, thrusts herself into the bedroom with these women and doesn't even think about the consequences. Or is just <laughs> flirting her little heart out um, and trying to figure out, you know, because she, <laughs> she's like, I'm sexy, I'm Luca. <laughs> you should want me. <laughs> 
she talks like that too, right? <laughs> that was so work. Yeah. No, that's not the way I approached women when I was in clubs. I don't think that would work. That's too comedic. <laughs> That's not how you talk a girl out of her skirt. I'm sexy and I know it. <laughs> <laughs> sexy and I know it. Yeah, but then, of course, you know, I go for the older song, which is, um, wait, now I'm not, um, what's the what runway song? Like? Oh, God, I, I, I've lost it. It was in my, uh, I'm too sexy for my shirt. <laughs> so yeah. sexy it hurts. <laughs> I'm too sexy is the name of the song. There we go. <laughs> Your, your your characters should have like um, background music or whatever, like themes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look at Bucka Chicka, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I can't write the end of my group. No, no, that's all I can hear. <laughs> I've ruined you for life. Yeah, uh, pretty much. Uh, to, oh, God. Going on this comedic vein that I have going on, um, I wish I had time to read all of your novels in their entirety. I was able to do that uh, for the cocktail hour interview. And when I read a body of work, I tend to find out little writer's quirks, right? <laughs> And your particular quirk, other than, you know, professional women with French braids, is afternoon delight as a phrase. <laughs> He's, like, showing up, like, in every book. I was like, really? Ah. So I have, yeah. a, I have, I, I actually highlighted them on my iPad. No, you did not. I so did. <laughs> it was fully, totally, well, until you told me about it, it was, it was unconscious. It was an unconscious use of words <laughs> uh-huh well well you know what the first and only time i actually have been introduced to that was in goodwill hunting where da- matt damon's character is messing with the psychiatrist and he's speaking the lyrics to the song and uh you know <laughs> You know, the, flight. afternoon delight. delight yeah. Okay, so here we are. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I've, I've highlighted it, and this one is from Beyond Innocence. And um, I love reading people their work right back at them. It's oh, absurd. God. Okay. Uh oh. Didn't take a genius, genius to discern Serena was displeased. Maybe she didn't like bars. There are only a few other women in the place, but one couple in the corner was treating the quiet bar like a good place for afternoon delight. <laughs> <laughs> and if I remember properly, I think also in another book, which I can't remember which it was, where Sky was not wanting to be afternoon delight for, you know, fancy pantsy lawyer. But I don't yeah, know. see, see, here's the deal. That one you just read, I put there for you. Oh, my like, God. I didn't have that in the book until after we did the cocktail hour, and then I put that there just for you. Oh, you're just darling. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I don't know if this one. Ah, yes, here's another afternoon's oh, light. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Slingshot, and I'm going to read the paragraph before to get to the, re- you know, the, the paragraph with Afternoon Delight. The drive was short and boring. Every block in this area looked the same, run down, unkempt, plain. Billy's last address was a dive. Big surprise. I parked at a nearby stop and shop and waved at one of the hookers, pretending to look like she was only stopping and shopping. I didn't have much cash left, but I cared about my car, as in I wanted the battery, tires, and other necessary parts to be attached when I returned. She mistook my intentions, but quickly pulled her hands away from my waist, and I set her straight. I don't need afternoon delight. I only want you to keep an eye on my ride. (laughs) I was like, did you just say that to a prostitute? Really? (laughs) We're not we're not talking about like a high end prostitute or anything. Afternoon delight. No, we're talking about ten bucks for a flow job. <laughs> you say the most delicate things. 
Um, let's see. Battle axe. Let's see if I have one in here. My notes. No. There was one in Battle Axe, but I didn't highlight it. What? <laughs> oh my God. I, you know, I had written you and asked if it was possible, you know, it would be kind of funny for people to find Afternoon Delight in one of your books, but I figured that was going to be too hard. But I love that you write Afternoon Delight in your books. <laughs> I think everyone should have an Afternoon Delight. Damn straight. Of it's course. my childhood. <laughs> I mean, the song, you know. From my <laughs> okay, that wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the song. Well, it makes me think of you know like somebody. My head I know. It makes me think of like you know somebody going home for a nooner. Yeah, well, that's exactly it. <laughs> it's one of the many ways you can experience an AD after the life. Do you know what? I can totally see you maybe a few days from now in the shower doing your business and then the song will pop into your head. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it'll totally ruin any plot I was thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to the story. Luca Bennett has this quite interesting relationship with a cop. Yeah. Who's, who, she's, she's got a little hot going on. And what I think is interesting with Jess is they they gel, you know, they they kind of riff on each other and they know what they need from each other. And, you know, I'd almost wonder <clears throat> what it would be like if the two of them fell madly in love and realized that, you know, that they had wanted more after all. Huh, I wonder. That's an interesting plot. <laughs> <laughs> Act now. <laughs> that is interesting. Wow. <laughs> Sometimes I have thoughts in this crazy noggin of mine. Well, um, so did you, you read Battle Axe? Yes. Yeah. So, no, I, you didn't like it? I, it was terrible. No, I'm kidding. You know, what? what is interesting for... Um, Luca in Slingshot, you get to know her, and she has a few things that are really settled about her life, and that includes having Jess as somebody that she can hook up with. And, you know, she lives in a dive, and, you know, even though she at times has money for rent, she kind of doesn't prioritize that. She has other things she likes to do. She likes chicks, uh, she likes to drink. And she likes to gamble. And yeah. so and you, you kind of see how she seems to be a chip off the old block for her father. And then you have Battle Axe where everything is turned on its head when all these bachelors are finding Lady Love. <laughs> and she's just like, what the fuck is going on here? Exactly. This What's wrong with you? Have you all had brain transplants? What's going on here? You know, and she feels like on the outs and she's feeling lonely and pensive and wanting more. Wanting more. Wanting more. Ah, yes. But, yeah, so it's interesting to see her development in the two books. And also, I thought it was, I was not expecting such a snippy end to, uh, uh, a paramour action, you know, a little fling action that was in Slingshot, which I'm not going to mention. Um, you'll have to figure out that mystery. Um, but, <laughs> but I was reading where you were tying up that particular plot loose end, and it ends with, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Carson didn't just say that. Oh, my uh, God. I didn't say it. Luca did. <laughs> I see. That's another fun thing about writing in first person. <laughs> All right, hide behind your, your creative prowess. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I started this series, um, I my goal was to make it about, you know, I, I write a lot of romance. Um, and my goal was to write a mystery series that had a romantic arc in it. Um, 
And so I'm working on book three now, and there might be some... Afternoon delight. There might be, well, I mean, more than that. Love. <laughs> there might be. There might be some four-letter words. <sighs> and um, That makes me think of crosswords. Let's do a crossword puzzle. <laughs> Let's do crossword puzzle and pen. Oh, my Four God. Four down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's hot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... So yeah, I think um, I w- you know I wanted to show look at grow grow. Now I didn't say change, and I think that's an important distinction. Um, People don't change very much. There may be slight changes in in trajectory, um, but I, I you know people don't change that much. Well, it's interesting because I get lots of mixed reactions to Luca. A lot of people like that you know she just kind of lives by the seat of her pants. But it really bothers some people. It's very interesting. Well, it can be disorienting, you know, to to have someone who's so all over the place and she's, you know, very non-linear plot going on here. Does she bother you? No, not at all, you know. You know, some people are like, you know, I wish you would pay her rent and, um, you know, maybe clean up her apartment. And I'm like, really? Because then she wouldn't be who she is. <laughs> then she would not be Luca, which, you know, brings me, uh, what, you, what I interrupted so unceremoniously was um, Mickey Knight is also a hot mess. And that's uh, the Mickey Knight series is Gene Redmond's, which is told in the first person. Boy, is that character a hot mess. She um, is. Um, but if she stopped being a hot mess, she would not be her. I mean, yeah, she... Yeah, I mean, and you know, Mickey has um, grown throughout that series, um, but the, the crux of who she is hasn't changed, um, I would venture to say. Well, she has, you know, <laughs> it's like a shiffer robe. She doesn't just have some baggage. She's got some, you know, I, I don't know. Are you... She's got some dark stuff. Oof. You know? Very, yeah. very, very dark. And that, that's one thing that I'll actually say about, even though there are areas uh, that there could be propensity for darkness, that's not something that um, permeated the, the stories. None of the ones that I reviewed did. And I don't think you really write that way. Whereas Jean goes to dark places, and I kind of like that. I, you know... I, I mean, Mickey Knight series is hands down one of my favorite. Um, I purpose... I mean, I... You know, it's it's very hard to admire someone and then try and write a series told in the first person of Miss, you know, blah blah. I I really did not want to take any chances of trying to emulate her. First of all, because I would fail, and second of all, um, because Mickey Knight is Mickey Knight, and I no one, you know, there doesn't need to be two. Um, I really chose purposely to make Luca not dark at all. Um, and she's, she does have some stuff. She's got a lot of baggage, but, but it's not. Well, I think, you know, no matter what story is being written, even if it has like a a premise where we have the commonality of first person and, you know, uh, Mickey Knight is a PI, but, you know, light night and day from Luca Bennett and there's another series where, where it is very clear that this is an antihero, and that's in the Motor City series, uh, written by three, Therese Szymanski, and she has this character, Brett Higgins, who owns um, owns like a, a stripper. Uh-huh. It, it's not just a strip place; it's also you know a movie house. The den of ill repute. <laughs> Totally. And she owns sex shops and she's definitely um, organized crime is a part of her her game. But what I find interesting about her is that she against um, against her nature, she thinks that she feels she has no redeemable qualities. She sees herself as a dark um, character that, you know, is, is just a criminal and, and that's just who she is. And in reality, in every story, every novel, you know, she really does have heart and she cares about people. And, 
you know, she's so flawed. And I could see a lot of folks, including myself, you know, it set my teeth on edge at how unfaithful consistently she is. And I imagine that's similar to how people feel about Luca, you know, like, pay your rent, wash your laundry, <laughs> ew. <laughs> you know, like, you're, you're nasty. I wouldn't want to have sex on your sheets, ew. <laughs> well, I like her that way. <laughs> you like her raunchy. <laughs> I do, because, you know, I mean, it's, it's the part of every, every one of us has that id Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> of course. You just got to get in touch with your inner Luca. <laughs> <laughs> that would be such an in- interesting thread on Facebook. <laughs> get in touch with your inner Luca. What would that mean for you? <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, and and the funny thing, getting back to Luca, she she gets snookered, like I said, from you know, hot broads that are supposed to be on the side of law in some way, shape, or form. Like Ronnie is a is a lawyer, and um, smut girl, no, <laughs> you know, awful diamond, you know, diamond is you know, she's the Marsha Collier now, and uh, she's. She is really a sketchy bitch. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I mean, Lu- Luca meets Diamond for the first time in the story Boomerang. Mm-hmm. And, um, and she's actually assigned, um, or she gets a case to, to go pick her up because um, she thinks she's a murder suspect. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so yeah, I, I've, so I've kind of brought Diamond back in, in Battle Axe, but okay. she's a... A character that I've played with before. I like Diamond. <laughs> it's just like, that sounds dirty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she, she is a tricky bitch, though. I'm telling you. I'm like... So, you know, who's the one constant in Luca's life that's never... Jess. Tri- is- yeah. Well, I want to, you know, we're talking about interesting characters, and in Slingshot, we have... <laughs> a butch pissing contest of sorts uh, with uh, the homicide cop Teresa Perez. Yes, she sits um, next to um, our good Luca, and you know casts a shadow because she's much larger um, and thinks mu- very much of her bad acidness. <laughs> She's a prominent character in the book I'm working on now. Ah. Uh, so. I, I also, <laughs> as I live and breathe, like she actually, I can't believe this, she actually came over when uh, Ronnie was talking to Luca, and, was, and she's like, oh, I can take care of this. You can't handle a Latina. <laughs> you know, you, you can go scurry away. And... <laughs> That was so not the case. And like, you know, Ronnie was not having it. And she, you know, she keeps on telling, uh, you know, Teresa keeps on telling uh, our Luca Bennett to, to scram. And she's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> My gun's bigger than your gun. Yeah. That's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, My gun's bigger than yours. Even though there's no strap on sex in your books. Terrible. Um, but I'm, ugh, I'm so disappointed because that's what I look for when I'm reading a, a, a I don't know, legal thriller of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a prerequisite. Gavel, you didn't notice that? I, <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, oh, the gavel. Mm. Code word gavel. <laughs> <laughs> that would be an interesting short story. <laughs> Now the the fun thing about writing a series is getting to like use these characters over. I yeah I agree and um, you know one of my writing sheroes is um, Radcliffe mm-hmm. and um, one of the things that I find so satisfying as a reader who's read a lot of her work is where 
you're introduced in, into a book which is not a part of a series, but there are characters from other novels that are there as if, you know, she creates a community that exists that has continuity of sorts. And for most readers, I'd like to say, they like series because they don't have to say goodbye to their favorite characters. Exactly. And I find it satisfying when it's not a series, but we still have, you know, little cameos that are made. Well, I don't know if you noticed this, but I, um, I do that a lot as well. I have Sky. Sky. Knocked um, up Amy. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> Amy's expecting in her third trimester and she might pop. So like Sky might be unreliable towards this case because of that reason. Exactly. And I, um, I have a book coming out in December called Rush. It's a standalone ro- romance. But um, Parker and Morgan from It Should Be a Crime make an appearance. Sweet. Because, you know, it is, I mean, Dallas has way too many lawyers, but, but the criminal legal community is actually fairly small. I mean, there are a lot of lawyers, but it's a tight-knit community. Mm-hmm. And it's very common that these people would would overlap. I, I have, um, Ryan Foster, um, from <clears throat> nothing but the truth is making an appearance in a Luca novel. Oh. So yeah, those so are, that, those are like really fun plants. I have a queer question for you since you're being, bringing up the, the, the tight little community. When yes. did you, when did you transition from being a legal Eagle to being one who writes about the law? In May. Of this year? Yes. <laughs> of this year. <laughs> uh, you know, cart before horse or, the, you know, the heart. Well, anyway. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I wrote, my first novel was in 2008. It came out in 2008. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have eight. Eight two, since 2008. Um, but in May, I left my practice... And um, my wife and I have a business that we're doing, and in addition, and then I'm writing. So mm. that is a transition. It's interesting. Like the, it's interesting when certain folks decide to make that kind of choice. I know that Decky Bradshaw, you know, stepped away from her regular gig to write full time, and I think because uh, Rachel's. Uh, son is going to school she's also spending more time being an author as well definitely is it scary living by the sea that pants yeah it's definitely scary um i mean you know we have this other business and we're very excited about it my wife is an artist and um we opened an art licensing agency we actually represent 11 artists and we are marketing their work to manufacturers to put on products, you know, like China and linens. And oh yeah. I actually know a little bit about that. Um, I think it, cause I like watching true crime and whatnot. And there was this woman whose husband, uh, you know, he passed away, but he, he was an artist and they had sold their licensing to a particular woman, um, who was a, was a shyster. <laughs> And she was not giving them the money, and she was also selling knockoffs and whatnot on eBay. And oh, no. Yeah, she was a squirrely little character. And so she, the wife, even even after this woman's been convicted, has been fighting to get back control over um, the artwork of her deceased husband. Wow. And it's just, I you know, whenever you have, you know... So, I think I can't remember what the the series is. I think it's called Greed. Is called the series, and it goes through um, Ponzi schemes and right. yeah. The thing that that you know rings true for all of these is I always feel bad for those who get snookered out of their money. Like if you're if you're gleaming the cube and you're trying to you know do things that are nefarious and whatnot, that's one thing. But taking people's work or you know their savings, their livelihoods, that just that yeah. That, well, I mean, it's just it's just sad. The true victim crimes, you know. 
Mm-hmm. But this this business we're doing where we're not ripping people off is. Um... <laughs> I didn't mean to assume that you guys were. I'm teasing. Um, it's you know like I've been writing and getting to fulfill that creative dream, and um, this is a way that Lainey can. We're hoping to make a, a business up for art. So um, we're we're off to a great start, but we're very excited about it. So it's like we get to all creative all the time. So I know. I was just thinking that there's just a lot of synergy. Definitely. <laughs> Which is cool. I I. <clears throat> Do you have, uh, I mean, your partner is, Lainey is an artist. Do you have a, a, an art background? No, but I do all the, um, all the legal stuff. <laughs> you know, the contracts and, um, I'm the front person. So, so she gets to be the art. She's, she does art and then she's also an art director for our other artists that we've signed. No, that's cool. You know, that that's definitely really, it must be, I think, I don't know, for your well-being and happiness, it's nice to be so involved oh. in creativity all the time. Yeah, definitely. And it's just the, it's a very, I mean, it, I take it, I take the job very seriously, um, but it's a passion mm-hmm. and it's, I'm not saying practicing law wasn't a passion, but it's a stress. It's a, it's a different kind of passion. It's a very stressful passion. And, um, I'm very excited to transition into something that is not so mentally wearing on me. Um, well, I mean, it, it, it's also hard. it's, it's hard. spiritual as well. Like there, there's a heaviness, especially if you're a defense attorney, you're dealing with people in, you know, their starkest moments. Yeah. It's, it's very draining. Um, I really enjoy the experience. Um, but it is very draining and, you know, it's something I think everyone should, could benefit from taking a step back from. And then, you know, maybe if I felt like returning someday, I always can, you know, once a lawyer, always a lawyer, but plus you can teach if you, if you were so inclined. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So we are coming close to the end of our, of our time together. Oh, no. I know. I know. I, I'm virtually passing the Kleenex to you because I know it's, <laughs> this has been a very meaningful experience. Uh, <laughs> and, and before we say goodbye, we have a delightful book giveaway. Woo-hoo. Yay. And you have listeners out there. A choice between Beyond Innocence or Battle Axe, which are very, very In, different places, I have to say. That's true. But, you know, some people don't, some people prefer third person, and some people prefer first person. So, you know, it gives kind of a choice. Well, they have different flavors. Obviously, I, I got into more depth with um, Beyond Innocence, but I think some of the fun of, um, the shenanigans that our, our, you know, our intrepid uh, bounty hunter gets into is that it has a lot of spoiler action in there, and it would it would ruin half the fun if I got into detail when it comes yeah. to that. But they have different feels to them, so you know you <laughs> see what mood you're in. Um, email me the Liz McMullen Show at gmail.com. All you need to do is. Um, send your email, indicate which book that you're interested in. And what I do is I put everybody in a pool and I use a um, randomizer that I found online. And that's how the, the winners are chosen. It's very scientific. You put them in a swimming pool? <laughs> yes. I put them in a <laughs> swimming pool. You know, there are little floaties out there if you're uncomfortable. <laughs> No, yes. You, you. And whoever doesn't drown gets a book. <laughs> yes, you, you need to stop joshing me, Carson. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're not. not. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you for coming on the show. You're completely awesome, and I think I might have you on again. Oh, please, Lizzie, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you asked so nicely. So thank you again for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. 
you're a treasure. Thanks for doing this for all of us. You betcha. 